What's the condition of the stuff in the world? It's dying. It's decay. It's dying, precisely. So, uh, was that uh, the original intention? No. You can see it was subjected to futility. So it wasn't always in that, uh, in that condition or status. That is a sound of creation's all wrong. Uh, so it wasn't intended to be this way. When people look at the world, they don't see what God intended, but they see what, it, what the world has become. So it is futile, that is not reaching its goal, not, uh, not accomplishing what it, uh, what it was intended for, what it was created for. But it's been subjected in hope. In hope of what? Verse 21. Because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So you have the idea of bondage and liberty, slavery and freedom that, uh, that are being contrasted here. Right now, things are not free to accomplish their goal, to accomplish their ends, because the principle of death uh, is in the world. For we know, verse 22, that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. So the image here is of a woman who is in labor. The creation is being compared to a woman who is in labor. And she is experiencing the feeling of uh, torment and the very real possibility of death. Uh, for us, uh, in, uh, today, women are not as likely to die in childbirth uh, uh, because of advances in medicine. But that was a very real possibility. So she is in agony. She is in torment, and, uh, and she is facing the prospect of death. But the idea is that what is about to come uh, on, the other, uh, on the other side of this event uh, is new life, birth. So as a woman struggles, is in agony, is dying uh, in childbearing, then life and uh, birth come following that. Verse 23, not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. What is, uh, what is meant here by first fruits of the Spirit? First fruits in the Bible is the... The best. best. Well, it's, it's not quite the best. Um, what, uh, what are you doing, Mary, when you go to your garden okay. each day? You're caring for it. You're tending for it. What else are you doing? Watering it, weeding it. All in anticipation of what is to come. So you're, you're watching to see, along with doing all those other things, you're waiting. When will the tomato begin to, begin to come forth? Yeah, begin to ripen. So you're seeing it happening, you're excited about it, you're hoping that the birds or the rabbits won't get to it, uh, but you are anticipating what is to come. So as you begin to see the tomato form becoming, it's you know, initially something small, it's not the color that it's going to be, uh, but you see that it's beginning to happen, and you're looking forward to it. Uh, to it so that's what he's talking about with us. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has begun to do his work, but it's not yet been manifested what the full thing is. So what will be the full thing of the, of the Holy Spirit's work? Jesus' return, but that's going to bring about what? Resurrection, the renewal of all creation. So we now see the first fruits, the beginning of the of the budding, the beginning of the flowering, but we have not yet seen what it's going to, uh, what it's going to be, what's going to happen. And so the uh, this is likened by Saint Paul uh, to adoption. The idea is that uh, is that one uh, one is born into a parentage that is corrupt and that is leading on to death, and so you are trans. Uh, trans Formed, you are uh, transited, brought over, transported into a new existence, a new family, a new reality. Now, Roman 
culture at this time is not all that different from ours. If you were pregnant and you wanted to rid yourself of the pregnancy, uh, there was no Planned Parenthood clinic for you to go to where uh, a surgeon uh, could dismember your body from the inside. Instead, you would go to a pharmacist and you would receive pharmacaea, uh, pharmacology, and the pharmacaea would uh, bring about an abortion. It was an early <coughs> version of Ella or Plan B or something like this, these, uh, these drugs that will, uh, that will kill the baby in the womb, uh, as opposed to needing to do it surgically. But if that didn't work, what would you do with your baby? If it didn't seem, if, if you didn't want the baby, uh, you didn't want another mouth to feed, uh, or it, uh, the, the child you know, seems to be uh, imperfect in some way, or perhaps just if she was a girl, you didn't want a girl, you wanted a boy, what would you do? If you were in Rome, if you're if you're a Roman, Paul? Infanticide, if you expose it or yeah. kill it. Yeah, so yeah, I, I just reading. leave it out, look, put it outside. Leave it outside. Uh, and, and it will simply then die. Uh, but does anybody know what Christians began to do? They began to adopt them. They would go gather these children up, these babies up, uh, and bring them into their homes. They established orphanages. Um, and this, as much as anything else, began to, uh, began to really speak to Roman society. These Christians actually cared about these people, about, about the people that everybody else is discarding, that, that nobody else wants. And this had a transformative effect uh, on Roman society and began to uh, draw people to the church because they said, see, how they care about, uh, uh, about these children. The pro-life movement is often accused of caring for unborn babies, but not caring for babies after they are, after they are born. Um, and of course, it's, uh, it's a sad kind of thing because uh, they will lay this accusation uh, against, uh, against the pro-life movement, but then they will also try to uh, eliminate uh, and, and repudiate any kind of support that, uh, that a woman might receive from a place uh, like our local assist pregnancy center. Uh, the, uh, this is seen as not being a good thing, not being helpful. How dare you try to have these women uh, have their babies and try to offer them support, uh, job support, uh, parental support, uh, getting them diapers and clothes and these sorts of things. But this is the kind of thing that Christians need to be engaged in. Uh, caring for uh, caring for orphans, caring for mothers who might otherwise be tempted to uh, to destroy their children. Uh, so the church was really uh, a big part in bringing about adoption and caring for these children that nobody uh, wanted. And that becomes then this this image also of what God is doing with us. He is adopting us, bringing us into His household, and He is going to bring about uh, the uh, the transformation and renewal of our bodies. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope for what he sees? Verse 24. The point is, there will be no hope in heaven. Doesn't that sound terrible? Um, but the idea of hope is that you are anticipating something that hasn't yet come to pass. So in heaven there will be no hope, uh, because it will not be necessary. Uh, what, uh, what is hoped for will already have come to pass. Uh, so, this is what we're uh, expecting, this is what we're anticipating. Uh, for if we, but if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So, we continue the course, we stay the course, we are anticipating this. Likewise, verse 26, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, where do you hear groaning? That are uh, that are wordless. You hear uh, you hear shrieks, cries of pain, but uh, but not always intelligible words. Right? If we wanted to, if we wanted to go find that right now. Where would we drive? Yeah. Hospital, nursing home, precisely. Uh, and sometimes uh, it can be very disconcerting, especially if you uh, if you 
end up visiting somebody uh, or, uh, or end up in one of these places yourself where you hear, uh, you hear cries and groanings that are not answered by any kind of staff. Uh, I, when my sister was at that uh, nursing home uh, out, uh, out in Fairfax, uh, I would always uh, dread maybe it's too strong a word, but when I would go in and pick up my sister on Sunday mornings and bring her out, uh, I kind of dreaded going down the hall because there would be these there would be these shrieks and cries of pain, and people would see me walking in here like this, and they they think I'm coming there to be nice to them. Actually, I got to get my sister and get out of here because I'm late for church. Um, so, but there are these people like help me. Help me, and nobody would. Nobody wanted it. So I, it was every Sunday morning. I was depressed being in that, uh, being in that environment because there are these groanings which cannot be uttered. So what's being depicted here is somebody who is in pain, who is crying out, and even you know, crying out these wordless cries, desiring for salvation. So what is Saint Paul saying here? The Spirit Himself is engaging uh, with us and helping us to pray, even when we are just groaning. Uh, he supplies uh, he supplies the words and turns them into uh, words for us. He's engaged and active uh, in uh, in intercession. So all things work together for good to those who love God. Now, having seen what the context of this, what is meant here by all things work together for good? What what kind of things particularly does Saint Paul have in mind? He uses the word all, but context would be what sort of things? Bad things. Bad things. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, you, uh, if you've got money in your pocket and a, and a full tummy uh, and, uh, and good weather and a, and a house to be in, uh, you're not going to stop and say all things work together for good because you're, you're just happy enjoying the good. It's when you are suffering. It's when things are going wrong and badly that, uh, that you then uh, need to be reminded that God is taking this thing and working it uh, for good. So St. Paul is writing to a community of people who are suffering, who are in anguish, like a woman giving birth to a child. They are experiencing the bondage uh, of creation, uh, that creation is now permeated with this principle of corruption. So uh, what are we going to say? Skip ahead to verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us. And this doesn't mean I will have no adversaries in this world. Uh, you will. You will have the adversaries of the devil, everybody else in the world, and the sinful nature. Sentence. It is God who justifies. 
So the devil can't bring a charge against you because God justifies you. Now what does justify mean? Make right. Uh, to, to make right or to, uh, or to declare right. We know from our own experience uh, in courts that sometimes people go free that we say, well, they shouldn't have gone free. But maybe they had a really good lawyer, maybe the case got thrown out on technicality. Maybe we don't understand why the judge or the jury allowed such, uh, uh, such a miscarriage of justice to take place. But somebody that we have determined is guilty ends up going free. So that person has been justified. They may very well, in fact, be guilty, but the court has said, not guilty. You are free. So God justifies. God declares righteous. And this is a forensic action. Uh, forensics means uh, in the legal category. So uh, God makes a legal declaration of, uh, of the sinner that that one is holy, that that one is justified, that that one is not guilty. So God justifies the sinner. And if he does that, then who can bring a charge against you? The devil no longer has a case because God has made his declaration. Who is he who condemns? Verse 34, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. He was even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Who can condemn you if Christ, into whom we have been joined, uh, if he stands at God's right hand, if he has been raised from the dead, then there can be no more condemnation to stand uh, against you. And he speaks to the Father on our behalf. He intercedes. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, you can see uh, concerns uh, of Christians, the Roman Christians. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. Those are the concerns that they are facing. So what the scripture is saying here is not, life will be rosy if you become a Christian. Everything will go better for you. In fact, it might just go worse. Why? Because God is testing you. God is purifying you. God is teaching you to rely only on Him and His Word. So, here's the condition. St. Paul then uh, uh, brings, uh, brings in a passage from the Old Testament. For your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So he's thinking here about the martyrdom of Christians that they are, uh, that they are undergoing. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And now we get to uh, more language from the hymn that we just sang. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So these are the things that we face. Death, life, and angels, principalities, powers. I think that here angels doesn't refer to the good and holy angels, but to the fallen angels. So the principalities and powers of this, uh, of this world. So these spirits, these demons that are arrayed against you, they can't do anything to you. They can't harm you. Um, then uh, things present or things to come, not today or tomorrow is the idea. What about height or depth? What do you think he's talking about there? Yes, that is exactly what it's saying. Not the things uh, high above uh, in the spiritual realm, nor the things uh, far down below in, the, uh, in the, the darkness of death and the grave, uh, as well as in hell. None of these things, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have created things being distinguished from the Creator. The Creator is... Uh, in charge and responsible ultimately for all created things. Therefore, do not fear the, anything that is going corrupt in creation. Now, what this is not saying is that created things bad, uncreated things good, uh, so physical bad, immaterial good, but rather it's saying 
physical things have entered into the bondage of corruption. That's what now permeates these things. But do not fear that corruption because God is going to make uh, all things new. So this Bible passage should not be taken to be a, uh, a reference uh, to everything will go well for the Christian in this life if you just have enough faith. But rather, in the midst of all the suffering, in the midst of all the troubles, in the face of death, you can be confident of the resurrection. Now, um, I uh, would like you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Does he mean by I can do all things? 
can I can endure. Yeah. So the picture here is not of a man who got to the top of the mountain and achieved his goal. And if you really wanted to depict this pictorially, you would have a man who has fallen to the bottom of the mountain and the boulder is on top. And then that's when you would bring out the Bible passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not I can push this boulder off of me, but I can even be crushed and killed by the boulder. Uh, that's what this Bible passage means. So don't put this in a weight room. Uh, don't put this up uh, at the exit to the locker room so that all the football players can pat the sign as they go out, we're going to win the game. But rather, I can be in the gutter. Uh, because I have Christ who strengthens me. That's what St. Paul here is saying. So this is why context is really important. Popular preachers will take a Bible passage like this and will use it to manipulate. You can achieve your goals if you just have enough faith, if you're just confident enough. And if things are going badly for you, if your marriage is failing, if your cancer has returned, if your child will not speak to you, if you simply have too much to do and not enough time to do it, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, is not your motivational tool to accomplish your goals in life, but rather, it's your motivational tool to realize even after it all kills me, I still have Jesus. And therefore, I can persevere through, uh, through the tough times, through death, uh, not confident that life will turn out well for me now, but rather confident that I will attain onto the resurrection. So that's what's going on here with this idea of, uh, uh, of the hymn. Uh, and when uh, the hymn then concludes in the last stanza uh, you know, by saying, I am no longer sad, the things that trouble him still exist. He still, this is Paul Gerhardt, he still lost his job as pastor of the Nikolai Kirk in Berlin. He's still out of his job. And his wife is still dead. And his kids are still dead. And his house is still burned. And the cart with his remaining goods has also been taken away from him. None of that has actually changed. But when he says, I am no longer sad, he's confessing, because I have God. I have the promises of Christ Jesus. I have the resurrection. So these, are, uh, these Bible passages can be very motivational for you not motivational in the sense that you're going to achieve your goals in this life, but you'll get the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection. All right, let's, uh, in the remaining time that we have, let's talk about, um, Marlon, the farmers here. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to ask a question that backtracks a little. You said that Satan is the saying the general confession, 
and hearing the general absolution spoken by the pastor. But what the conscience does is it says, or if you will, Satan is whispering into our ears saying, that's not actually for you. This is for everybody else, but it's not for you. It's you. You're really bad. You are really bad. And so the, the heart then despairs. Uh, and the best example of this is Jews. Judas, what does he do after he is in sorrow for his uh, betrayal of Jesus? We, but before he kills himself, where does he go? He, yeah, well, it's not the Pharisees, actually. It's in the temple. It's the, the chief priests, um, the pastors of the church. He, he does exactly what you're supposed to do. He goes to the pastor. But this is the greatest example of bad pastoral care in the scripture. Because he goes to them and he says, I have sinned. And what's the job of the pastor when a person comes and says, I have sinned? I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But they say, what's that to us? You see. That's the worst kind of pastoral care. You need to get better. No, where, where I encounter this is... Uh, it happens, but well, it's not like it happens every Sunday. But but I am I wouldn't be surprised at all if it's happening every Sunday in people's minds, and sometimes even uh, sun you know Sunday morning, you know six seven in the morning or Saturday night, where somebody says, "I'm not going to church. Why? I'm too I'm too bad. That's not for me because I'm bad. I've had people say to me." Good, pious Christian people who come to church regularly say, Pastor, I am not going to communion today because I have done such and such terrible sin. Well, you of all people need to get yourself up there because what, what's happened is their conscience is accusing them. But they're saying, I cannot go to the place where I will receive absolution. I can't go until I improve myself, until I until I get better, until I get right. Yeah, so uh, so the very means, it, it is as though uh, a person has just received a gunshot wound and says, well, I will wait to go to the hospital until I'm feeling a little better. Well, what's going to happen is that you're going to continue to bleed out. So no, we go to the place of healing uh, immediately. So the conscience is good, the law is good, the commandments are good. And we don't want to, we don't want to, to throw them aside and say, isn't it great to be a Christian have the forgiveness of sins? Now we can forget about the commandments. No, the law is still good. It, it guides us in what is good. But the Christian then comes back at the law in a new way, saying what now accused, what formerly accused me now becomes my God. And there's where the uses of the law and the catechism come into play. Curb, civil function. Mirror, the conscience accusing us of our sin. And then God leading us into uh, what is good and right behavior. Now what happens, the law being written on our heart becomes corrupted over time. And I like, I like to think that this works in similar ways to uh, properties of our body that, uh, where this is more obvious. You and I, Ruby, share something in common. We need these. Take this off, you're a blur. Thank God for these, now you come into, now you come into focus. But what happens is that the eyes over time can, be, can deteriorate, the ears can deteriorate. Uh, the, the ability for us to run or to get our heart up to a very high rate or something like that, it's gradually going down every year. It's getting a little worse. And I think the conscience becomes like that, where the conscience, which was once deeply pricked by the smallest sin, we, we learned over time, we kind of justify our sin. Well, yeah, I know talking bad about people isn't right, but I mean, that person's really pretty loud, so they kind of deserve it. In fact, I really ought to let everybody know what sort of bad person that is so they can be aware of it. You know, so we begin to justify and rationalize our actions. So the conscience, which was uh, good uh, in the heart, becomes gradually corrupt, and we start to grade on a scale, compare ourselves to others as opposed to the standard of the law. Somebody over here had that. Yeah. Well, no, so that, you know, that, that sort of feeling you know, that phenomenon you described, I think, you know, kind of leads to the, the, the double-edged sword of uh, penance. You know, if you're a Roman, yes. you, you get penance, and so for a pious person, now you feel like you can do something to merit. But the problem with that is um, eventually you come to doubt the efficaciousness of the penance. 
sure it's something you do. The yeah. thing that you do, you can sum to death. Right. Uh, which is the ultimate sort of downfall of uh, any sort of work practice. And this is the really understated beauty of the catechism. When it says confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. And second, that we receive absolution. That is forgiveness. Uh, from the pastor, as from God himself, not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God. The point is, two parts, not three, not confession, absolution, penance, not confession, absolution, you better get better, uh, but rather confession, forgiveness, done. Now that's in terms of justification. That doesn't mean that we can be done with the, uh, with the Christian life, but rather we do good things out of a out of proper, good, and healthy motivation because we desire good as opposed to uh, desiring to work off the penalty of punishment or to improve enough to be worthy of Christ's uh, forgiveness. That's one that way Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. All right, well, this idea of righteousness uh, then comes up in uh, today's gospel reading where we have the righteousness uh, of man. Your righteousness needs to be better than the scribes and Pharisees. You're not getting into heaven. So there's the human righteousness of our achievement and our accomplishment. And then there's the higher righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to us, that is credited uh, to us. It is as though uh, what belongs to Christ has been deposited into your account. So you are passive in the, re in the reception uh, of that. Now, uh, one thing that uh, it's been on my mind lately is uh, the, the Christian will say everything that we do is sin. That there is no good in a, in a person. And that is coram deo before God. But when a person who is not a Christian hears this, it really upsets them. Uh, because, uh, because they'll say, well, that's, that, that is manifestly not true. I see people who are not Christians doing good things. And I see people who are Christians doing bad things. Therefore, your teaching is false. Uh, and they would be correct insofar as the information has been presented to them. We need to make a distinction between civil righteousness, uh, which is before man, and, uh, and the righteousness which is coram deo, before God. People do good things in this world. If you drive the speed limit, if you pay your taxes, if you are, if you help an old lady across the street, uh, then you have done a good thing in this world. Those are all good things. They're not good before God in the sense of meriting justification, meriting God's forgiveness and wrath. So we need to make a distinction between the civil righteousness. We want people to be civilly righteous. You want your next door neighbor to be a nice guy, somebody that you could actually entrust with a key to your place uh, who would help you. That's good for society, it's good for the world, and you don't have to be a Christian to be a good person uh, in that sense. When we say that everybody is a sinner, that there are no good people, we're speaking about uh, before God uh, in the sense of what, uh, what justice was. So we need to make that distinction, otherwise it just really upsets people. When, Especially the idea, Luther says these things like, even the good that you do is sin. And he's right. He is absolutely right about this. But, uh, but he's speaking about it before God. Nothing you do uh, is perfect. And even when you do something good, it's, well, that was really good that I gave a contribution to the church, or that I was uh, helpful to other people. Uh, Luther says, no, even that is a sin. Uh, because you're, you're uh, happy about its goodness, and you think that God accepts you. Uh, so we have to make this distinction between righteousness before God and righteousness in the world. And they are not, uh, they're not the same thing. Uh, so do good things and praise people for their good things, but, uh, but we need to make clear that that's not good before God. Because the standard of God's law is something very, uh, very different. So that's uh, part of the topic that comes up in today's uh, Gospel reading, which we will uh, discuss more. Now next Sunday, uh, we, will, um, we will be having an exclusionary uh, uh, topic, uh, something separate. Pastor James Sharp of Baltimore uh, 
uh, formerly serving in Google Congregation in Baltimore, uh, has been called to be a missionary in Uruguay. So he's going to come and talk to us about the mission work that he's going to be uh, undertaking. He'll be preaching here next Sunday and, uh, and uh, giving a presentation in Bible class. Uh, and then we will, uh, the following Sunday, uh, return to our uh, uh, journey through the world. Let's conclude with prayer. In the midst of hurtful things in this world, things that cause us to struggle, external opposition, and we own our own sins, comfort us, O oh Lord, not with the false gospel of human betterment, but the true gospel of your Son, the dear Lord Jesus Christ, and full forgiveness. Teach us in the midst of things that cause us to suffer, that we can endure these things on account of your Son, Jesus Christ, who strengthens us. In his name we ask these things.